Some parents talk about raising teens like it's the best thing in the world. And some parents, actually what I've found is more parents, talk about it like it's the hardest thing in the world. Well, what are the ingredients that determine whether you're going to love it or whether you're going to hate it? Granted, nothing in life is guaranteed. However, I did some research and found that there are some simple principles you can set in place or practices that make raising teenagers a lot more enjoyable because it's going to help you meet their needs along the way. So today's episode, I'm here to help you love raising your teenagers and these will help you with your little ones as well. Let's jump in. Hi, and you're listening to Java with Jen with your host, Jenna Lee Samuel. Right, for today's episode, we're diving into teens. We're rounding out February, all things relationships and love. And we're finishing off with teens because for those of you who have teens, this can be a very difficult, challenging season of life. So instead of focusing on the challenging aspects, I wanted to focus on ways to strengthen and nurture that relationship. Because really, when it comes to kids, if we put enough of the good stuff in, usually a lot of the challenges will kind of take care of themselves because many times with kids or really any relationship, challenges that come to the surface are oftentimes just a reflection that the relationship has not been nurtured enough. So eight ways to strengthen your parent-teen relationship and stay tuned in Life Hacks where I share a great way for those of you who are bookies and love to read how to save money buying all the books that you want to buy. And uh, I know I put a bunch of books in my Amazon cart the other day and it was like 90 bucks. I was like, what? (laughs) And I went and found it elsewhere and spent less than $20. So that's in Life Hacks, so don't miss it. All right, jumping into this, ways to nurture your relationships with your teen. Now, I remember growing up, my mom loved having us as teenagers and I remember hearing other parents talk about how hard it was having teens that was the worst season of their life and I always kind of wondered even when I was a youth pastor I was like okay here's my chance to get in their heads and try to figure out why some parents have a hard time and why some parents don't and ultimately every relationship comes down to how well are we nurturing it if we're putting the right ingredients in you'll get a great relationship for the most part. If we're not putting enough of the right ingredients in, things start to go wonky, just like in baking. You don't put enough baking soda and that whole thing is flat, right? So here are eight ways to strengthen the parent-teen relationship. I did some research, so I am pulling from the experts on this. The first one, very simple and practical, is hug your child daily. Physical contact is super important, especially as you get older. It is a stress reliever, it combats loneliness, and it's just a reminder that, hey, someone cares about you. In fact, I was impacted by this just earlier this week. I was at work and there's someone at work who I felt like I wasn't real sure if they like me or not, you know, but it's kind of that subtle thing where it could be all in my head, you just don't know but it didn't merit asking, you know? And so, but that person walked by me and squeezed my shoulder or patted my back or something. And just that little gesture, I literally felt myself melt on the inside and it soothed all those questions. I was like, oh, huh, okay, they're all right with me. Okay, cool. And just that little gesture. And so sometimes I have to remind myself with my kids We're so busy, you know, trying to stay on schedule, barking orders, making, sorry, maybe you don't bark. Sometimes I bark and I try not to, but trying to make sure things are getting done. All the systems are still rolling along properly. We're getting homework done, chores are done. And we can forget just to stop and give our kid a hug, pat their back, you know, swipe their face with the back of your hand and just kind of like a, like a soothing gesture. The little tiny things like that can do a lot, especially for your growing teen who carries a lot of tension and stress in their body. And so first way to strengthen that relationship, just give your kid a hug. It reminds them that they're not alone. Secondly, this one's a little harder, a little harder to do, 
but what can be done is to turn off devices during your interactions with them. So I started just challenging myself I have to be on my device a lot because I run two businesses, work for the church, do all kind of manage a gazillion social media accounts, run my house. I mean, like literally, you know, there's an app for everything. And unfortunately, that means I have to be on my phone a lot. So with that, I've just tried to make the discipline that when my kids come into the room, that they're not having to look at the top of my head because I'm looking at my phone, not giving them my attention. I know that in some relationships in my life, I feel bold enough to ask for full attention when we're talking. And I realized I feel like it's a matter of respect that I get eye contact when I'm talking to someone. And so I realized, you know, if I feel like I deserve that, then I also need to be willing to give that. So I put my device down, even if the kids come running in and ask me a question, I just try to turn my screen over, pick up my face, and look in their eyes the whole time they're talking to me. It's very simple, a very simple little discipline, and but I think it goes a long way to signal to them, you're actually more important than my screen. I really don't want my kids growing up thinking that my screen was more valuable than they were, and so I'm trying to be very diligent about that and also turning off devices during family time um, maybe not just one-on-one -on -one conversations but when it's time to be together as a family dinner time family game time family hangout time just minimizing devices really helps to nurture that relationship and creates time to visit with each other Another way that you can do this is, the third way is to connect before transitions or major decisions. And so this can be, you know, if your kid is learning to drive and gonna be taking their test, if they've got major projects due, if they're about to fly the nest and go to college, um, just anything, if there's anything that feels major in their life, it could just be a major event, reach out and let your child know that you're there for them. They're kind of navigating this whole, I feel like an adult, I realize I'm on the precipice of having to take responsibility for my whole life and I don't feel ready for it. And so there's actually a lot of stress that teens carry in their bodies, in their souls, that just letting them know, hey, I want you to know this is a big deal and I know that and I see you and I'm here for you. If you need advice, just come let me know. If you need a hug, just come let me know. Um, some suggestions were to offer advice, but not to boss them around with your advice. So I think part of that dynamic that makes raising teens challenging is that teens are biologically growing into their adult selves where they feel the responsibility of caring for themselves. Like my boys, once they cross that 13, 14 year old line, I find that they start wanting to pay for their own stuff. And I love that. That tells me they're a healthy functioning, growing into a healthy functioning adult because they feel that sense of personal responsibility. And I love it. And the same thing is with their life decisions. I think sometimes parents, if we get, if we don't make that transition with them, recognizing, hey, they need more freedom to make decisions for themselves and me be less of a micromanaging parent and more of a supportive advice given when it's needed parent, uh, if we don't make that transition well, it can actually add stress to them because it sends them the message that they're not competent, but yet they feel the pressure of having to become competent. And so us shifting to a supportive role um, really plays a big part in them feeling like they have the confidence to move and grow into their next season of life. Being supportive and understanding is a part of this. So I had listened to a podcast by Caroline Leaf who said that the most stressful time of a human being's life is actually between the ages of 11 and 14 when they're going through puberty. Um, and that's because hormones are changing, their body grows rapidly, emotionally they change a lot. You guys know this, from 11 to 14, like their state of mind changes a whole lot and grows up a whole lot. And so the number one thing they need in that time is actually to be listened to. So we oftentimes think little kids, or at least I have, that little kids need more attention. 
But the reality is the little ones need more attention in that they need me to do more things for them. But as they get older, the attention that they need shifts in that they need more of a listening ear and more of a supportive response. They want to feel like you believe in them in the way that they're growing into their adulthood and their capability to handle life. They want to feel your support. And so when there's major transitions or major situations happening, connecting with them, letting them know you're there for them, giving advice if they want it. Um, but not bossing them around. Maybe sometimes I find you can offer advice even if they're not asking, just by asking questions that makes them think through the results of their decisions. So like, how do you think that's gonna work out? Well, let's talk through that. Um, how's your budget gonna be? If you get a job there, how much are they gonna pay you an hour? Okay, how much do you think that you'll need for rent? How much do you need for this? Okay, so asking questions to help them process through difficult times or you know, life challenges, um, shows them that you're supportive, you're walking with them, but they don't feel like you're bossing them, right? And then as they're expressing themselves, um, being supportive and understanding. Now, I have to be honest. I want to be understanding. I'm not always prepared in conversations that just hit my radar that I need to have an understanding position towards my child. <laughs> Sometimes I just, if I'm just reactionary or just quick to respond without perceiving what their needs are in that moment, I can, I can really fail at the understanding side. So being understanding and supportive is going to mean that we as parents need to just take a very quick pause when those conversations are happening and ask ourselves, what does my child need from me right now? And that, that is a discipline that we have to build into our thinking. Um, but it's a great way to connect before they go through transitions, major decisions, and all the conversations that can come out of those seasons. So number one is hug daily. Number two is turn off devices during interactions and give them your eye contact. Number three is connect around major transitions or major decisions or just major events. Connect and let them know you're there for them. Offer advice if they want it, but be supportive and understanding, okay? Number four is make one-on-one -on -one time a priority. We try to do this, and I find that the mantra that has been around since my parents were parents, maybe longer, that rules without relationship equals rebellion is so true. I think that is one of the truest mantras of parenting of all time. Rules without relationship equals rebellion. And we know the rules can't go away. Rules are always going to be there, right? But the relationship can fluctuate. And so what determines if there's rebellion in your child primarily is the health of the relationship. And so making one-on-one -on -one time a priority is really, really important because then your kid will know that you're for them and they'll have more of a trust and a grace threshold for those rules when they come. Um, distance between two people, you guys know this, distance weakens the relationship, but it can take, it can be as simple as just 15 minutes to connect that does a lot. And so what I try to do when I want to connect with a kid is do something where I know they know that they have my full attention. So like with my oldest, he loves to play guitar and because that's something he loves, um, and I like music too, it's become something I enjoy doing where if he's playing guitar, sometimes I'll just go in the room and lay on his brother's bed and just listen to him play. And I'll just ask him little questions. Oh, what chord is that? What song is that? What are you working on? We should do a song together. You know, just little things to show interest. And he may not talk much about life in those moments, but it does kind of nurture that connection and it shows him, hey, I see you. I'm loving what you're loving. And... It just creates that sense of connection. With another one of my sons, sometimes I have a harder time getting him to put his guards down and connect. And so I'll go on a walk with him and we'll hold hands and we'll just walk up and down the neighborhood and I'll just ask him questions. And if we're moving, talking, or doing something, his guards come down more easily. I think because it, dis it just distracts him. And so there's different ways to make one-on-one -on -one time a priority. With my youngest son, he wants to lay in bed and snuggle. And so we do that. With my third son, 
Um, he's very content and kind of self-satisfied. And so with him, I try to go out of my way to maybe take him to run errands with me where I can ask him questions about his life and, and just take time with him. So there's different ways you can make one-on-one -on -one time a priority. But again, just 15 minutes of, of really isolated connecting time can do wonders. And don't be afraid to ask questions that will dig below the surface. Sometimes we get stuck on surface questions and asking other ones, asking deeper ones is, is really meaningful and it helps them to know you're not afraid to go there with them. If you struggle with what kind of questions to ask, there are apps you can download. I have one called Make Talk and I downloaded that actually for date nights when I'm with my husband. But I went out to dinner with Shiloh the other night and he, he saw the app on my phone and so he took the phone and he started asking all the questions. And it was such a great conversation and asked all kinds of random questions that are lighthearted. Some of them are deeper. Um, and it just made for really good conversation to build rapport. And then so if you do some like lighthearted questions but you get them talking and, and feeling heard, then you can kind of gradually move a little deeper into the content you're asking them about their life and that's really helpful. So number four is make one-on-one -on -one time a priority. Number five is encourage emotions. Don't shut them out. This can be a challenge, especially when we're dealing with people's unpleasant emotions. Sometimes I can feel the need to like, oh my gosh, stop freaking out because I don't like how it makes the environment feel out of control. Um, but I have to remind myself like, hey, Emotions are not bad. Emotions are good. Emotions are part of the human experience. And so when they're having strong emotions and I'm on my A game and responding well, um, I can make space for it. Say, golly, you sound so frustrated. Like what's going on? Or where is that coming from? And especially during an argument or during hurt, if they're being disrespectful or hurtful, I'll sometimes tell my kid, hey, listen, I can tell you have a lot underneath that, but you're being pretty disrespectful with your feelings right now. So I need you to go take some time, kind of gather yourself, think through what's going on, and then let's talk when you're calm because I want to understand what's going on. And so sending them to kind of process their heart for a few moments by themselves usually will calm them right down. And then I'll pull them back in and be like, okay, what did you figure out? What's at the bottom of that? Why did you get so angry? What is actually bothering you? And by doing that and making space for their emotions, maybe helping them name their emotions, sometimes, especially with one kid, um, his emotions will show up in anger, but I try to help him dig down. Okay, you may feel angry right now, but what's driving that anger? Do you feel disrespected? Do you feel lonely? Do you feel unheard? And I'll try to help him hone in on what specific emotion is driving him to anger because anger is a secondary emotion and so help them get down to the bottom of that and what you're doing is you're teaching them that a their emotions and they have lots of them right their emotions are not bad um, and you're helping to teach them how to process their own heart and become self-aware human beings and that is honestly one of the number one traits that I think makes or breaks any relationship. If you get married to someone who's not self-aware and they just act out of their emotions all the time, they're gonna destroy that relationship because anger is destructive, right? So it's important that we teach our kids, hey, your emotions are, are good, they're normal, but you have a responsibility to manage them. So making sure that when they have emotions, that we make space for it but that we also guide them through how to handle it well and make sure they know, hey, I'm not intimidated by the fact that you have these feelings. Let's just sort it out. I wanna, I wanna understand what's at the bottom of it. Um, number six is listen to understand, not to react. I don't know about you, but I have found in all the relationships where I feel safe, understanding is a core pillar of that relationship. Any relationship where I do not feel safe to be myself or don't feel like I can truly be me, usually a lack of understanding is present in that relationship. So when your child is talking, when your child is having emotions or whatever, your teen, 
listening to understand what their heart is really saying is going to be huge. And so you're not listening to figure out how to react to their situation. You're listening to understand. And part of that means asking questions, asking questions to dig a little deeper. Listen to the situation from their shoes. It can be really easy for us to stay in our perspective. But I tell my kids all the time, listen, if you refuse to see it from anyone else's perspective, you will never have peace in that conflict. What brings conflict to uh, to peace is when you can listen from their perspective, see it from their eyes, and offer them understanding. It's huge. I can't, honestly, I can't reiterate that enough. It's It's powerful. And if your kids feel understood, they're going to feel safe with you. When I was a youth pastor, I remember driving in the car with a bunch of youth girls and they were telling me about all kinds of crazy stuff that goes on at school. You guys have probably heard me say this before. And I remember being shocked and asking them, do your parents know about this? And they were like, no, 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 no. I said, why don't you girls tell your parents this stuff? And they said, because our parents just don't understand. And so... For me, it was an eye-opener of how powerful it is that I offer understanding to my kids. And I, I, (laughs) the other night I failed at this. We were at the dinner table and the boys were laughing about a situation that was actually not good and needed correction. And so they were laughing and they were sharing it at the dinner table in an effort to connect Um, And maybe even to push the lines a little bit. But what I should have recognized is that, and I kind of felt it, but I didn't really know how else to resolve it. Um, I felt that they were wanting to connect. And I was like, oh, this is not a great time to correct the situation. But I also can't leave this uncorrected. And so at dinner, our family dinner turned into a lecture time because I decided to correct it in that moment. And I realized later in retrospect I just needed to offer the boys the gift of being heard and kind of meet them where they were. And then later, after we had had dinner and made all of our connection, later bring it up and be like, hey guys, back to that conversation point. Hey, maybe we should have, maybe we should not do that in the future. You know, bring it up later, I think would be a way to protect the connection, but still deal with the issue when it needs to be dealt with. And so that's that's something I learned in the moment. Um, and so part of understanding is understand where your kids are at in the conversation and what they're looking for from you. Okay, number seven is respect boundaries. And especially as the kids get older, this is really big, but I think teaching them the importance of boundaries is always important. And so good parenting makes room for failure. It's normal and it's where we grow. And so even even when failure happens, um, whether that's I didn't get my chores done or it's I got really angry and hurt my sibling or I came home with an F on my test because I cheated, whatever it is, boundaries are important. Communicating boundaries and talking about those things, but also... Um, teaching them the importance of having boundaries and setting boundaries and establishing boundaries. And so, you know, with that, I'd be like, okay, well, then we need some boundaries. You brought home an F because you cheated. Why did you cheat? Um, Because you didn't study. Oh, so you didn't feel like you could actually do well. Okay, well, then we need to protect our study time. So a boundary that we need to have is maybe no sleepovers when you know that you have a test coming up that you need to study for, you know, or whatever. And so teaching them about boundaries, boundaries with their time, boundaries with their bodies, boundaries in relationships. Last night, I went to say goodnight to one of my boys and I just didn't like the way he was treating me. He was trying to be goofy, but it felt really disrespectful to me. And so I've just learned with that child. I'm like, you know what? I don't like how you're treating me. So I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to my room because I deserve respect and you're not treating me with respect. And so I'll leave, but he wants me to stay in there. So he'll adjust his behavior and he'll apologize. And so that's how I show boundaries for myself and that I respect myself. And then if your kids, we had this issue a couple weeks ago where my kids were playing on the musical instruments and I was filming them. Well, one of my boys didn't want me filming and he got very upset because he was mouthing to me, don't film, stop. 
but you know, kids, especially boys are always telling me to put the camera down. And so I was like, no, I'm, I'm just kidding, catching a little video. Well, he got very upset about it. And later he was like, I didn't want you to film me. You know, he got kind of ugly. And I was like, well, listen, I will respect that boundary, but you also need to handle how you communicate it respectfully as well. You don't need to get upset. You just need to come let me know and then ask me to delete the video, you know, or whatever. And so communicating boundaries, respecting boundaries when they say, please don't do that is very important. How you respect their boundaries will teach them how to expect people to respect their boundaries. And the way that you model having boundaries for yourself will teach them how much of a right they have to have boundaries for themselves. And so boundaries is an important thing with teenagers, but it does come with a lot of communication. As you do this and as you respect their boundaries, this will build trust in the relationship. And so respecting boundaries, communicating them, and demonstrating them is really important with your teenagers, but it's a great way to nurture the relationship. Okay, the last one, the eighth, is catch them doing something right. So many times with our kids, we can get caught up in trying to make sure we're not letting bad habits slide, not letting misbehaviors go undisciplined because we don't want it to become a habit, etc. But we need to program ourselves, especially if we want to nurture the relationship, especially with boys, but honestly everybody, is to look for ways to catch them doing something right and then call it out because their confidence is already fragile and they need your vote of confidence more than criticism. Criticism comes very easily for parents. And so we have to be very intentional to look for when they're doing something right that deserves praise. And then we need to praise them for those actions. And sometimes I like to brag on whatever their win was to somebody else so they could overhear me bragging about them to other people because that also builds trust, builds rapport, and just makes their heart swell feeling like mom's in my corner. It shows them when you do this that you have been paying attention to them and it boosts their self-esteem. So if you're looking for their wins, it shows them you're in their corner, that you've been watching them so they feel seen, they feel recognized. It boosts their self-esteem. So those are eight simple ways. I'll reiterate them one more time so that you can have just a little refresh. First, most simple thing is hug them on a daily basis. Hugging, touching, patting, stroking the hair, stroking the face, any physical contact that's affirming and affectionate can literally melt away the stress in their life and combat loneliness. Number two, turn off devices during interactions. Give them your eye contact. Um, and this also includes sometimes turning off music so you can talk in the car. We have a TV in our car and I have been recently turning off the TV and turning off the radio so that we can actually have a conversation and it actually has done wonders. Three, connect before just transitions or around major decisions or major events. Let your child know you're there for them. Offer advice, but don't be bossy about it. Be supportive and understanding as they're learning to spread their wings and fly. So connecting and communicating around transitions makes them feel supported. Um, the fourth one, make one-on-one -on -one time a priority. Just 15 minutes of this can do a whole lot. Number five, encourage their emotions. Don't shut them out, um, but help them process them healthfully. Encourage them to step away, to take a minute and gather themselves, and then come back and communicate through those difficult emotions. Number six, listen to understand, not to react. Your goal when communicating with your child is to understand their heart. So pursue understanding to create an environment of safety, listening from their shoes so that you see things from their perspective makes all the difference in a healthy relationship. Number seven, respect boundaries, demonstrate boundaries, communicate boundaries. Boundaries is a huge part of them growing up, but it also nurtures that relationship and builds trust when they see that you will respect their boundaries as well. 
And the last one, catch them doing something right. Look for ways to affirm them. This builds their confidence, makes them seem, feel seen and heard and valued, and is a stark contrast to the criticism that they already feel within their own souls and even from the world around them. So I hope these eight things were helpful and encouraging to you. If you have a teen or even a preteen, if you know someone with a teen or a preteen, send this episode to them. Even if you just start working on one or two of these things, um, you'll just be nurturing that relationship on purpose. Listen, just like our marriages need to be nurtured, our relationships with our kids need to be nurtured. And so these are some really simple ways to do that. Start with what's simple and applicable. Maybe the hugs and pats and little words of affirmation is a great place to start. But you guys, I hope that you loved February's episodes. I love diving into relationship things. Don't miss out in March. We're diving into uh, still kind of on relationships, but more about mental health and and life and new birth and dealing with ourselves. And so the next episode is on self-care and self-love from a Christian perspective. The one after that was very much a request from you listeners, and that's postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety. And I brought on a psychologist, therapist, for both of those episodes. So she's able to bring her expertise on both those topics. And then the topic after that is beauty and brokenness and how they coexist together in our lives. That one is just a really refreshing episode. So I'm looking forward to all these episodes we've got coming up for you guys through March. And with that said, I love y'all. Come follow and connect on Instagram at Java with Jen. And go get you some merch at the merch store, javawithjenmerch.com. And I will see you guys next week. Oh, and don't go anywhere because we have life hack right now. Okay, today's life hack is for those of you who are book lovers. Okay, so I had a list of like four or five books I wanted to buy. And I got on Amazon and put them all in my cart. And I was like, $90 later, I was like, oh gosh, it is so expensive to be a reader. Okay, well, I already told y'all last week or the week before about the Headway app, another great way to read more books in less time. You're basically reading the footnotes of the book. So that's going to save you some time. This hack is going to save you some money. Um, I got last night, what I did is I plugged in the title of the book I was looking for, and I just did a Google search and looked under the shopping tab, and I found my $18 book for sale over on thriftbooks.com for four and a half dollars. So I was like, hmm, I wonder if they have all the other books I'm looking for. So I ended up finding four of the five books I was looking for, and they were all around $4.50, $4.50. So I think I ended up getting four of those books that I wanted for less than $20 on thriftbooks.com. And I know some of y'all are major readers. So if you want to save some money, thriftbooks.com is what I rec recommend to get some really amazing books. And if you guys listen to my show for too long, you know I throw book suggestions out there at y'all all the time. So it's a great way to get your hands on those books at a more affordable rate. If time is the issue, just a reminder, you can download the Headway app and it will offer you all kinds of subscription prices. Here's my recommendation. The first price it'll give you is like $89 a year. Tell them, no, I don't want to subscribe at that rate. And then they'll say, hey, we have a present for you. Here it is for $60 a year. Then you say no again. And then it should keep dropping the price. I ended up with it landing at $30 a year, which I feel like is totally doable. That's like two bucks a month. And I have already read through 33 books or something. So I feel like it was very much worth it. Um, and so that will save you time and it'll save you money because you can consume a lot of books in less time, which means you're buying less as well. It's all digital. So anyways, there's your life hack. If you want to consume more with less time and less money, a reminder of the Headway app. Otherwise, thriftbooks.com. You can get your hands on the paperback copies for like less than five bucks for most of the ones I found. So there you have it. You guys, listen, thanks for tuning in. As always, if you guys are enjoying these episodes, it does take a lot of time and a lot of effort to put these shows together, which I love doing. Um, really, I just do it to serve you guys because it just gives me so much joy to do that. Um, but if you would, word of mouth is 
is my number one way that this show gets in the hands of other people. I don't know if you guys realize that, but there is no like magical algorithm that is shoving the show in front of anybody. It's really word of mouth. And at this point, I don't pay for marketing. Um, and so there's actually not a lot of ways to market a podcast at this point. And so, cause it's still kind of a new um, vehicle of, of learning. So if you guys would, if you know other podcast listeners or other believers or, or young moms that you feel like would benefit from the contents of my shows, would you send it to them? I really would love to see the show reach even more people and just encourage more people. And uh, it just makes all the work that goes into it that much more worth it. Um, but it also just means it's serving its purpose, which is to bless and to serve women, to enrich your lives, help you grow in the Lord. And um, that's my whole mission. So thank you guys for your support. And shout out to my sponsors. I had a sponsor this week increase their monthly giving, which was a total surprise and a total blessing. For those of you who want to support the podcast and didn't realize you could, you can do that through Anchor directly they have a give button or through patreon it's patreon.com slash java with jen and there's a couple of different um, options for monthly giving if you want to do just a one-time donation just reach out to me on instagram or send me an email um, at java with jen podcast at gmail.com and you can ask about that i'm on venmo and so that's the way that is the easiest to do that but when you guys do that, it actually is helping me to get equipment. Um, if I end up getting invited to events, it helps me have like what I need to set up a booth and continue to just get the word out about the show. And so I just want you guys to know how much I appreciate you. This community is so supportive, so encouraging. You guys, your feedback and the reviews that you end up leaving on the podcast app that I end up getting in my email are always a surprise and always like such a kiss and such a drink of fresh water. Um, they always come just at the right moment. And so I just want to say thank you guys for being such an awesome, supportive community. And I will see you next week. Come back to us in March. Let me tell you what's coming up. February, we did relationships. March, next week, I interviewed a therapist, a psychologist who talks about uh, we cover self-love and self-care from a Christian, healthy, balanced perspective. And then the week after that, we're gonna be diving into postpartum depression and anxiety with a whole lot of practical tools, ways to recognize if you have it, ways you can help a sister who may have it, all kinds of stuff. We just finished recording and it's super good. So come back in the next couple weeks. March is all about life and fresh and new beginnings and all the wonderful fun things that spring brings. So um, I will see you next week. And otherwise, in the meantime, I will see, see you over on Instagram at Java with Jen. Bye guys. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's show. For those of you who've rated or shared this podcast on social media, thank you. Reading your comments and reviews always means so much to me. Listen, let's stay connected. Come follow me on Instagram at Java with Jen, where you can follow the latest and say hey. It's a really great way to stay in touch. Many of you have also asked how you can support the show. You can make donations through the Anchor app or on Patreon. Or of course, by sharing, rating, and reviewing on social media and iTunes as well. Your heartfelt feedback always reminds me why I do this. Until next time, remember, you will fulfill your greatest destiny one day at a time.